Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Denver. Uh, I'm Mark Alstrom, President of the ESA Board of Directors and VP of Renewable Energy Policy for Next Air Energy Resources. And it's my honor to welcome you to the 2023 Meteorology and Market Design for Grid Services Workshop. How many of you are here at a, this is, this is your first ESIG meeting? Oh my gosh. Okay, excellent. You know, this is great. This is what this is all about. We're in this, the middle of just a critical time in our industry. Uh, ESIG, as I'll talk about, is really the group where we get together to meet other people who are seriously looking at these pathways toward the future. And so uh, for those of you who are returning, please reach out to all these new people. And for you who are new, just introduce yourself to everybody because we're, we're all in the same game here. And this is just a safe place to have those sort of discussions, make networking contacts, and really kind of develop you know, how we're going to cooperate on a, a very challenging and fascinating path forward. So, uh, and we're gonna need a lot of people to do it. I mean, this is turning out to be just a gigantic, and critical piece uh, for where society wants to go. So glad to see it. Let me tell you just a little bit about ESIG. Uh, ESIG is a global member-based nonprofit organization for those of us who are supporting the technical aspects of grid transformation and energy systems. And we do this through workshops, tutorials, webinars, blogs, working groups, and task forces uh, you know, for our members. It's really you who are participating in this. Uh, and, and by producing from that technical resource materials for you and briefing summaries for decision makers. ESIG also serves a leadership role in the Global Power System Transformation Consortium, often called GPST, working to support a global clean energy transition. ESIG convenes key participants to chart the technical pathways in a collaborative, reliable, economic, trusted, and sustainable way. As you'll see this week, by bringing talented and dedicated technical people together at the right time to talk about the right things, uh, we can really uh, you know, support the, uh, the speed of the transition. We're a catalyst for, for making faster progress and making better results. This is why you participate and why most of your organizations are ESIG members. This is why NextEra Energy and Polaris Systems Optimization contribute at a sustaining member level to support ESIG, the ESIG mission, and why Analytics and WEG are sponsors of our workshop here today. It's also why the US Department of Energy supports the unique work of ESIG and why other donors who see the benefits of technical collaboration for grid transformation and energy decarbonization also support ESIG. And this is why your participation in ESIG is so important. We're all involved in crafting the technical and engineering responses that are needed by our in industry and by society. The primary source of support for making this possible is your memberships. And I thank you if your organization is a member and I encourage you to join if you're not currently a member. The modest annual fee is based on the annual budget of your organization. And if your organization is a member, then everyone in your organization is a member of ESIG. Independent consultants and individuals can also join and ESIG provides free memberships to students of accredited educational organizations. Let me stress again, ESIG is a great place to learn and share your expertise, and we all need to do whatever we can to bring the talented people into our industry and get them working on the important issues. Uh, I wanted to share just a few of my own remarks here about the, the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, uh, which I have talked at some prior meetings, but I, I'm not sure how closely you're following it. Uh, being at NextEra involved with the technical policy, I'm following it pretty closely uh, because it is a really big deal. Uh, the IRA was passed last year and it had broad impact on clean energy and clean hydrogen. The administrative guidance is gradually coming out and it may still be months or a, a year or so to, for the full impact to become clear, but we're already seeing major new manufacturing announcements due to domestic content requirements and changes in a lot of business strategies out there in terms of how we're looking at the, the rest of this decade and beyond. The tax credits for wind, solar, and storage in the IRA are, are really the first long-term incentives for wind, solar, and standalone storage. It's not a two or three year extension. You know, really the, the law reads that it continues until 2032 or until the US electric generation emissions are reduced by 75% from 2022 levels whichever is later, which likely means that the incentives continue for the next 20 years. 
These policies will be durable regardless of future administrations. And we've already seen billions of new, new announcements and investments in domestic manufacturing and new energy projects that will largely benefit economic development and job growth in conservative states. So we think this is a long, durable incentive that's going to completely change our, our world in the energy space and for decarbonization in general. The extent of support for green hydrogen is particularly interesting. Uh, and everybody is waiting right now for IRS guidance on the precise definition of what qualifies as green. The opportunity is massive to replace existing needs for gray hydrogen, which is derived from natural gas, with green hydrogen from electrolysis. And even before we talk about the additional uses for hydrogen in the future, the IRA incentives make this cost effective to do this type of green hydrogen. However, green hydrogen would require massive amounts of renewable energy for its production, in addition to everything we're talking about already. Uh, and we're also seeing massive growth of data centers with growing AI loads that you've all heard about, crypto mining, electrification, and even carbon capture and storage, you know, actually technologies will, will take a lot of additional energy, right? So we appear to be entering a period of unprecedented load growth. And this is why we have a new parallel conference here this week uh, on long duration load forecasting, in addition to this meteorology and market design workshop. So to put it mildly, it's an exciting, just, just amazing time to be in the industry. And I'm so glad that all of you are here to, uh, to, to discuss this learn more about it together, you know, and talk about how we're going to actually make this work. Because obviously there's a lot of coordination and, uh, the, you know, I always say, I, I don't think we're looking for breakthrough technologies. So much of it is we have cases where we have a dozen different ways we could proceed together on this, but because we all work together as an integrated system in the energy space, you know, it's really about choosing the pathway that's gonna make the most sense and getting going on that together in a, in a coordinated way. Uh, let me just move on here. I just want to kind of give the ground rules for, for eSig, just uh, usual disclaimers. I mean, obviously, we're from all sorts of different companies and entities and organizations. We're here to, uh, to talk about technical issues and move the whole industry forward in a longer, duration, longer term basis. You know, obviously, uh, watch out for any sort of antitrust, uh, you know, anti-competitive type behaviors, as I think you're familiar with from other meetings. This is a safe place. A lot of, you know, we're mostly technical engineering folks. Uh, it's a great place to actually sit down and talk with peers and make progress. And we're not talking about individual projects and things like that. The other thing that I'm, I'm very, very uh, focused on myself is uh, that, you know, ESIG will not tolerate discrimination or harassment of any type. Uh, we're here to respect each other, to talk as peers and, uh, and behave in a professional way. You know, so I uh, just want to make sure that everybody knows that you are welcome and included here. Uh, and if you have any concerns about anything, please talk to me directly uh, about that. Just want to make sure that this remains the safe, inclusive place uh, where we actually get stuff done here. So with that, uh, I'd line out, like now to welcome the executive director of ESIG to the stand, Charlie Smith, for a meeting and industry overview. Thank you, Mark. And let me jo <clears throat> join Mark in wel welcoming everyone here to Denver. <clears throat> this is actually our 15th annual, uh, we used to be the uh, wind forecasting workshop, but it's grown since then to the meteorology and markets workshop. So welcome to all of you to this uh, historical event. <laughs> I hope we have many more. So I just want to run through the agenda for the, the next two and a half days. It's a pretty, pretty busy time between this workshop and the one going on in parallel on the long-term load forecasting. Uh, starting off with ancillary services markets and mapping products that uh, Emma Nicholson from FERC will be chairing. I just met Emma for the first time this year at an earlier 100% renewable energy workshop, and we hadn't met each other before. And we started talking. I said, Emma, you've got to come to a, an ESIG workshop. And she said, OK, invite me. So I did. So here she is. <clears throat> DER forecasting for operations. Um, 
Andrew from AMO came a long way to chair this session and to speak in some other sessions. So if you see Andrew around, take a take the opportunity to meet him. He's a experienced and interesting fellow. Just met him yesterday for the first time. Uh, session three, aligning retail rates and grid needs. Obadiah, the chair of our DER working group, is going to be chairing that session. Progress in the use of probabilistic forecasts. A panel discussion will be led by Julian Matoyvison from ESIG. And then a networking reception tonight at 6.30. That's usually one of the highlights of the conference. Great opportunity to see everybody in an informal kind of fashion, get to know some people that you might not know and make some new friends and also extend some professional contacts, professional ties as well. And then tomorrow, market design for 100% renewable is a very hot topic that Bethany Fru from NREL will be chairing. The state of the art and the outlook for renewable energy forecasting, uh, Sue Haupt from NCAR will be chairing that. Sue's a longtime participant in the, in the workshop. And then tomorrow afternoon, electricity market performance under extreme events, another very interesting session organized by uh, Eric Ela from EPRI. And then the data sets for future system planning and extreme weather events, another very hot topic. Hot topic, ha ha. <laughs> um, I was talking with, with Amber yesterday, Amber Motley from, from Cal ISO about uh, what goes on in the control room at, at Cal ISO during the hot weather events. And uh, she told me about some 80 hour weeks during the summer in the last heat wave that they had. Very, uh, very stressful time for her and for Cal ISO as well. Because it's, it's a, a hot topic everywhere, chaired by uh, Bri Matthias Hodge from NREL and UC Boulder. And then Thursday morning, wrapping up with a session on incorporating risk into power systems and markets, really drawing on some work that uh, is led by Dick O'Neill at RPE, previously a FERC. Many of you probably know Dick from his FERC days. He'll be chairing that session and then the closing plenary uh, on Thursday morning, which I'll be chairing. So a jam-packed week. I hope you'll all get something good out of it. And I want to say just a word about the... Uh, Q&A also, we've, we try we pretty successfully to uh, save some time at the end of the, each session for questions and answers. So we're gonna try to hold questions and answers until all the speakers have spoken in each session because when we start taking questions in between, it's hard to stop asking questions and we run out of time at the end of the session for, for a discussion. So uh, we'll, we'll try to hold the questions until the, the, uh, the end of the speakers. And, and also when you're asking your questions, I ask you to, to give everybody a chance to participate, come up to the microphone, ask your question, and then have a seat so that the rest of the people can ask their questions. And then for extended discussion after the, after the session, well, at the end of the session, if there's time left, we can go into discussion. But if not, the speakers are always glad to stick around and uh, have a conversation on the side after the session is, is over. I usually give a little overview of the industry because we're a little tight on time here today. I, uh, I'm not giving the, the usual uh, extended overview, but one of the things that people like is the, the summary of the outlook for um, bus bar cost of energy that Lazard puts together every year. And several people ask me about it and I have to confess that I didn't do it this time because they didn't do it. I, I look for that at the end of the year, you know, the October, November timeframe, they usually put it out. But last year, because of the uh, interruptions in the supply chain and the inflation, they, they didn't have a real good uh, picture of where things were at, so they didn't do it. So I, I won't be giving that update. But something that's related is the uh, impacts of inflation on the levelized cost of energy. Looking on the left-hand side, you see the impacts of inflation on the levelized costs of existing natural gas, new natural gas, and the new solar and new wind. And you see that the, the inflations hit the natural gas uh, side of the ledger a lot harder than the new wind and solar side of the ledger, which is in green there. And then on the right-hand side, <clears throat> a change, the megawatt hour comparison from 2021 to 2022 between a new gas and a new solar and wind. And you can see that in 2021, the uh, new solar and new wind were about 40% less than the cost of new gas units. And you can see in uh, 2022 that even in spite of inflation and the fact that everything went up, there was almost 50% headroom between uh, new gap, between uh, new solar and wind and, and new gas. So 
even though inflation is taking place, it looks like it's uh, hitting the, the natural gas side of the business harder than it is the renewable side of the business. So that's the economics really are, I think, at the end of the day, the real driving force behind the uh, interest in the expansion of renewables. And then this slide, which I just uh, updated last night, it's uh, really the story here is about the queue. You look at the right-hand side, there's two sets of, of bar graphs from 2010 and 2022, showing the installed capacity in the queue. So look at the change in the, uh, in the queue going from 2010 to 2022. You know, in 2010, we had about a thousand gigawatts of, of uh, capacity installed in the US in 2022, about 1250 uh, gigawatts. But the queue was only it was less than half the installed capacity. It was maybe 400 gigawatts, 450 gigawatts in 2010. It's now more than the installed capacity. It's actually a little over 2,000 gigawatts. I think it was 2,050 gigawatts in the queue. And the other interesting thing is the change in the queue as, as you go, even from last year. If you remember, I had a slide like this last year. It was about 1,400 gigawatts in the queue. So in one year, the queue went from 1,400 gigawatts to 2,000 gigawatts. That's a phenomenal growth in the queue. And everybody knows the other side of that is the, the transmission uh, story that because of transmission and the interconnection process, the queue is not getting processed very, very quickly and the capacity, the backlog just continues to grow. But the composition of the, of the queue is also amazing. There was more gas in the queue in 2010 than in 2010. 22, and there wasn't much at that, but the wind and, and the new <clears throat> component of the queue is the offshore wind. We didn't see that in the, the, last, uh, the last update. And then storage and solar, both hybrids and standalone. It's, uh, it's really the story of the future. And on the right-hand side, an interesting look at how the queue stacks up against the peak load and the installed capacity of the seven R RTOs in the country today, with the queue being above the installed capacity and and all of the ISOs and above the, um, I'm sorry, above the peak load and above the installed capacity in six of the seven. So big, big queue out there and a big, a big topic of conversation today. I think I'm going to stop showing this slide after this one. I used to show it to see how, how many megawatts of wind and solar we had going back probably 15 years or more. And then it became how many gigawatts of wind and solar we have. And now this is worldwide, globally. We're at 950 gigawatts of wind at the end of last year, over 1,000 gigawatts of solar at the end of last year. Both of those numbers, well, the wind number will exceed 1,000 gigawatts this year. So I think it's at the point now where the industry is a credible industry around the world. It's not going away. It's the way of the future. And that's what we're all dealing with. Still a ways to go in the US. This is from the... Uh, the EIA shows the composition of the fuel source for the electricity that's produced. And you can see about right now, 20% of our energy comes from renewables, 20% from nuclear, 20% from coal, and about 40% from natural gas. And that's, uh, you know, the renewables are, are growing slowly, and the uh, natural gas is probably about peak coming down slowly, coal is coming down much more dramatically, nuclear is just holding pretty flat. That's where we are in the U.S. today. And ESEG, I wanted to mention uh, two new user groups that have been uh, formed, the Probabilistic Forecasts and Planning and Operations User Group, which met, met yesterday that uh, Nitika Mago from ERCOT is chairing, and the GETS User Group, the Grid Enhancing Technologies User Group that Ken Donahue is uh, chairing. And then we've got the Operations and Maintenance User Group, which we've had for a long time. And also just wanted to mention the expansion of the working groups that we have in, in ESIG. This is really is a reflection of the activity going on within the organization, the areas of interest that kind of bubble up in each of the working groups. I think they're also listed on the website. I'm not going to go through them all here. I just want to let you know that there's a lot going on. And this is the opportunity for engagement in ESIG, They're member only activities. So if you want to participate in some of the nitty gritty work that's getting done in ESIG, the task forces and the project teams are the way to do that. Upcoming meetings, we've got the meetings here this week in Denver that, uh, that you're at. And then this fall, we've got the fall technical workshop in San Diego at the end of October. 
and then next spring, the spring technical workshop and the annual meeting in Tucson in March. So again, um, welcome to everybody. I wanna mention this uh, IEEE magazine, Julia and Jason and uh, Debbie and myself serve as guest editors for various issues of this. This is one that, that Debbie was a guest ed editor at. There's copies of it out at the uh, desk. It's the 100% renewable energy, 100% renewable markets uh, issue that came out last year. There's another one, uh, an update on other aspects that will be coming out this year. I just want to mention that it's a good source of very timely information. I want to welcome all of our visitors from around the world that are here, <clears throat> Australia, Chile, Germany, Canada, Japan, and I can never uh, forget to mention the great nation of Texas. So. <laughs> so while you're here, take some time, make some new friends, uh, get a little better integrated into what's going on in ESIG. I hope you all have a good uh, enjoyable stay here and look forward to talking with you more during the workshop. Thank you. And now I would like to welcome Emma and her panel to the uh, podium here for the first session of the workshop. And I, I see that the uh, I'm going to have to have this this screen moved because it's too close to the podium okay. here and we need to move it over so I, I gave Emma a brief introduction previously so we're very happy to have her here with us today and hope that she'll be back she's been doing a lot of really uh, important work at at FERC and glad to have her here chairing the session Hello, sorry. Hello and good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for um, attending session one. We have a group of all stars here talking about energy and energy and ancillary service markets. It's just specific focus on um, ancillary services. I am going to waste no time in getting to the meat of our agenda. Um, our first speaker is James Friedrich from Kaiso, and he's going to be talking about the day ahead market enhancements and ramp products proposal in Kaiso. You have a mic. Okay. Good morning, everybody. So yeah, I'm James Friedrich from the California ISO. I'm a policy developer there and I was um, working on this day ahead market enhancements project that introduced a new um, day ahead market product in the Cal ISO market called Imbalance Reserve. So I'll be talking a little bit about that product. Um, let's go to the first slide. So anytime you're talking about a new market product, it is helpful to have a little bit of background about the market itself, just so it's easier to follow and some Cal ISO specific context, I think would be helpful for diving into the discussion. Um, the Cal ISO day ahead market has two financially binding market runs we'll be referring to in this uh, presentation. The first is the IFM or the integrated forward market, which is the a uh, financial market that clears bid and supply against bid and demand and produces energy schedules and ancillary service uh, schedules. Uh, the second pass is the RUC pass, residual unit commitment. Uh, most ISOs have RUC passes or RAC passes, some, some ISOs call them, and 
Um, essentially, their purpose is to, after the financial market runs, the RUC compares the results of the uh, IFM to the day ahead demand forecast. And if there's a need to procure additional supply uh, to true up to the forecast, um, that, that happens in the RUC process. So these process are, processes are sequential. The IFM runs first and then the RUC. The second thing I want to mention that's not on the slide is that the imbalance reserve is a, is a day ahead market only product. Um, but the California ISO real time market does have a similar real time market product called flexible ramping product. And I'll be um, talking a little bit about the relationship between imbalance reserve and flexible ramping product in this conversation. So the flexible ramping product exists in our market today. Um, the imbalance reserve is a proposed new product. Um, so a couple of pretty pictures to describe the, the problem statement here that the CAISO is trying to solve. You know, like many ISOs, our resource mix is changing fast. We have a lot more solar and wind on our system in the last several years. Um, a lot more batteries coming online. And essentially, the, the, the challenge has been that as more renewables come on system, uh, the harder it is for grid operators to uh, feel comfortable with the supply demand conditions that result out of the day ahead market uh, going into real time because the variability and uncertainty of renewables um, creates some of, some of that operational risk that we have to address. So this slide shows uh, a density plot by month of what we're calling historical imbalance in megawatts. Um, so imbalance in this context is actually comparing uh, forecasts. Um, so it's comparing the day ahead market forecast to the sequence of 15 minute market forecasts in real time. And so a positive value on this chart means that the real time market forecast came in higher than the day ahead market forecast. A zero value means they're the same. And a negative value means the day ahead market forecast was higher than real time. So you can see, you know, Kaiso system is a peaks at around 50,000 megawatts. You know, an average day like today, we're probably having around 30,000 megawatts of, of, of load served. So plus and minus 4,000 megawatts of, of forecast imbalance um, is, is, quite, is quite challenging. That's quite a big percent of our overall load um, that can shift in any, uh, between every, any given day. And uh, especially these upward imbalance uh, figures in tight system conditions make system operators really nervous. So we'll talk about that on the next slide. Now the day ahead market, the Kaiso day ahead market today lacks a product to address this type of uncertainty and variability from renewables. So oper uh, Kaiso operators have been having to get this type of supply through out of market actions. And that's what this uh, slide intends to show. So we talked about RUC in the first slide. Um, RUC trues up the uh, financial market to the day ahead forecast. So what you're seeing on the slide here is actually the system operator taking that RUC forecast and biasing the number up. So essentially the RUC process procures additional supply beyond the median forecast. So RUC solves to we'll call a P50 or median forecast. Um, the, the system operators are basically taking that value and adding big numbers to it. So visually, what you're supposed to see is that one, you know, back in 2017, in the left-hand side, we've got a couple of dots there, meaning the operators are using them relatively infrequently, mostly on really high low days. But as we're progressing uh, into the current, um, those uh, dots become bars, meaning that the frequency with which they're using those out-of-market actions is growing but also the height of the bars is also growing, meaning the magnitude of those out-of-market actions is growing. And so we're seeing this, and, and anytime we see uh, system operators making out-of-market actions systemically, routinely, signals to us that we have some sort of gap in our market design that we need to address. So one last picture, and there's a lot of bars on this chart. Uh, I'm, I'm going to only ask you to focus on one specific one because you'll get the gist of it. Um, so it's organized by month and year on the horizontal axis, and I would turn your attention to uh, July of 2018, which sits kind of center right in the chart, and you can see that blue line in this chart is much, much higher than the, the lines next to it. So all this is intending to show is um, that the height of the bar represents uh, system marginal energy cost um, in, in four different markets, the blue line being 
day ahead market prices relative to three real time prices, which is HASP, RTPD, and RTD. Um, we don't need to know much more about that other than those are real time prices. And all you're all are intending to show is that um, when you have this blue line much higher than these uh, uh, orange, green, and purple lines, um, is showing a price inefficiency here, which is essentially that because system market operators are uh, juicing up the amount of supply procured in the day head market, the real time market is flushed with supply. Um, we're overcommitted, and in situations where the uncertainty doesn't materialize, um, you're going to have to dispatch resources down out of merit. You got a, a, a lot of uh, long start resources on the system that can't shut down quickly. So essentially is a price suppression effect in real time. And this is common uh, for other ISOs who have um, out of market actions similar to this. So um, we're seeing real price inefficiencies and other system, system inefficiencies by this frequent use of out of market action. And we thought to ourselves, we can do better by having the market uh, more accurately predict what the uncertainty values are relative to the uh, out of market actions for um, operators are using, but also procure the supply in a trade and in, in, through trades in, in a market context rather than um, out of the market as is done today. So we're introducing a new product, the imbalance reserve product. Just for context, uh, this product, um, uh, the proposal for this product was approved by a CAISO board in the Western EIM governing body in May. And our plan is to uh, file uh, this product with FERC this summer. Um, so that's sort of the stage that this is in right now. Um, essentially what the imbalance reserve is, is an upward and downward uncertainty product uh, relative to day ahead market schedule. So I'm gonna walk through what this figure is. Uh, the green line represents the status quo. This is the IFM, a level of uh, supply that clears out of the financial market. It's physical and virtual supply clearing against physical and virtual demand, okay? Now, what the imbalance reserve does is essentially takes that level and adds to it an upward and downward uncertainty requirement. So for the blue line, um, we've added in some positive uncertainty value. And the difference between the green line and the blue line is imbalance reserve up. That's the name of the product. And then we also have this red dashed line, which represents the, uh, the downward uncertainty. Um, and the difference between the green line and the red line is imbalance reserve down. So you can think of it almost as if the status quo is we're going to procure uh, a, a set point uh, in an energy supply, whereas the imbalance reserve product will bring in more of an envelope between blue and red. You have the ability to access um, quick ramping dispatchable supply um, to meet any sort of imbalance that occurs within that um, threshold. So, um, you know, in this context, again, uncertainty, just, just for uh, more clarity, uncertainty we're talking about here is, is in the net load forecast so that this um, definition, of uh, definition of uncertainty includes load, wind, and solar uncertainty in a, in a combined way. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about that if you're interested. So I'll be referring to this figure uh, again as I move into slide eight, just to talk about a, a few key features of the product of interest. Um, one is that th this is a biddable product. Um, so just like ancillary services and day head market, suppliers actually bid to provide the up and the down separately. Um, that's, that's unique among most types of uncertainty and ramp products and ISOs where because most of them are in real time, um, there's really not a, uh, not much not much cost in terms to the resource outside of energy opportunity costs that resources have to bear to provide these products. But because it's procured in the day ahead market, uh, there are costs to resources for um, receiving day ahead energy schedules and and having imbalance reserve awards that require them to be prepared to move in some direction the next day. And presumably they would incorporate these costs into whatever offer um, they have for the product. Um, the imbalance reserve product is procured within the integrated forward market. So it's co-optimized with energy and ancillary services, which is extremely valuable because one, you have unit commitment benefits of the market can evaluate the demand from load for uh, demand for AS and the demand for imbalance reserve in deciding its unit commitment decisions. Um, and also better uh, utilizes the system's ramping capability. 
Um, whereas in today's out-of-market actions are done in RUC. RUC is only residual supply. It's not co-optimized. So you're basically taking the leftovers from the IFM and that's the, that's the supply that you're using to find this flexible capacity. Um, so we think co-optimizing it is a much more efficient way to procure this supply. Um, the awards themselves are capped to a resources 30 minute ramp capability um, and eligible resources must be dispatchable in the 15 minute market, meaning that they can receive 15 minute market schedules and move and be dispatched along a 15 minute curve. So it does uh, eliminate hourly block resources that we have, certain imports, demand response, et cetera. Um, but most, most resources would be eligible um, to provide and balance reserve um, in our market. Um, and then just what, what does the award obligate you to do? Essentially, you let's go back to this slide. This would be helpful. So essentially, instead of thinking of this figure now from a system level, think of it from a resource level. So a resource receives a green energy schedule and they receive a pause, uh, an imbalance reserve up and imbalance reserve down uh, award. So in real time, what this obligates them to do is to actually offer in real time economically their energies from the red line to the blue line, which enables the real time market to dispatch them economically up and down as system conditions warrant, um, as opposed to self scheduling themselves in, in real time and the market sort of taking them as given. So it, it's a, essentially buying the ISO a dispatchable range on any resource uh, to be utilized in the real time market. And of course, there's um, we, um, part of the design is to have unavailability penalties um, to in, encourage adherence to these obligations in real time. Um, so the last slide, um, uh, this, first, this first bullet is really important and, and, and also unique in the sense that um, the Cal California ISO is um, experimenting with nodal reserve products, um, meaning that the imbalance reserve uh, imbalance reserves will be tested against transmission constraints, just like energy is, which is unique among reserve products uh, in the ISO RTO space. Um, so, just for context, in February of 2023, this year, the ISO implemented nodal flexible ramping product, which is our real time equivalent to imbalance reserve. Um, and so that, that has been going on um, since February. And we're essentially taking that same, similar process and applying it to the imbalance reserve product. Um, so uh, there's a long history and of ISO and RTOs with ramp products struggling with the procurement of these products because the market is really, really good at finding cheap reserves on resources that are behind transmission constraints. And you can find that in, in markets all, all across the, the US that have ramping type products, including the same issue with our flexible ramping product. Um, so it does two things, two bad things. One is that operationally, the reserves are useless if they're located or if they're procured on resources behind constraints, because if you need them to deliver energy, they, they can't do it. Um, but second, in terms of market efficiency, um, it, it absolutely tanks the market price because um, the market price will converge to zero because you're finding uh, resources behind constraints. Those are the ones that look cheapest to the optimization to procure. And so you're really getting no market signal out of your ramping product. So we think with um, uh, doing nodal uh, procurement of reserve, these type of reserve products, we can um, have better operational benefit of getting resources that can actually deliver their energy if they're needed. And secondly, we have a, a, a actual valid price signal. Um, so happy to talk more in more detail if anyone's interested about this process, these deployment scenarios um, after, after today's session. The last thing I'll mention is that like many um, reserve type products, imbalance reserve procurement is subject to a demand curve. So the market's, not will the market's willingness to pay for these types of reserve products is not infinite. Um, the purpose of a demand curve is to make sure that the operational benefit of the reserve is, um, you know, if the operational benefit of the reserve is less than the price you're going to pay for it, then the market won't will forego the procurement of that. Um, and also happy to talk after the session about um, a little bit more about how we came up with that demand curve. Um, so that's it for my presentation. Thank you very much. I'll leave this up here. Thank you very much, James. And I realized after you started speaking that 
what could be best described as grace under pressure, I completely forgot to introduce our panel and tell you what we're talking about. I wanted to infer, but um, we actually, we started late, we're gonna have to end on time. So I think that's in a cut into um, panel discussion. So I'll make this really quick. Um, I think your example, um, James's presentation set this up really well. The traditional um, design of ISO, um, ISO markets where you buy contingency reserves and for um, dispatch and plan for expected load, that model is increasingly stressed as net load variability and uncertainty increase from both variable energy resources and a more a less, less predictable demand side. And what you'll see today is the ISO approaches to manage this new uncertainty by um, getting more operational flexibility out of the system, the ability to increase and decrease um, resource output um, to manage to balance net load. Um, and California ISO, James um, described their um, their Dame product, which would create a new ancillary category, ancillary service category, um, on top of what they already have, which would be ramping products in their 15-minute and real-time market. And other presenters today are going to talk about how the various ISOs are approaching this new, these new and emerging system needs, you know, through ancillary services. And we're going to see some. Uh, the ERCAR presenter, um, Ryan, will talk about um, using an existing product, the 10-minute um, reserves to meet that need. Um, MISO will talk about how they, and, and, and KISO, are talking about creating new ancillary service products outside of the traditional spinning, non-spinning reserves of 10 and 30 minutes. And then we're, um, Ryan Choppy, um, Keith Parks will discuss about um, flexibility generally, and Ryan, Ryan Choppy will do a really great wrap up comparing the two um, approaches. Do you buy more reserves or do you add on new custom niche products like an imbalance reserve, short-term like, um, 30 minute product STR, which MISO has. Um, and I think this is a really ongoing live, live debate in the research community and ISOs, not debate, learning opportunity where we're all learning and growing and hopefully sharing our findings. So I'd like to invite our next um, speaker, Jason Howard of MISO. Um, he's the Director, Operations Misc Management, and he's going to talk about their short-term reserve and ramping products and how MISO meets its system needs. There we go. Okay, good. All right, thank you. Good morning. I'm Jason Howard, Director of Operations Risk Management at MISO. So I do want to, to say that there was actually a, a different presenter slated to come today. Uh, to talk from MISO because of our market products and, and the market design aspect of it. Uh, but since that person couldn't attend, I, I am filling in. And, and with that, I'm giving it a, a bit of a different twist, you know, and how these market products relate to actually our, our operations and risk management. So not only what these products are, but the things that we're doing at MISO uh, to manage the system uh, that we face today. So a common theme, you know, just as James mentioned, you know, across the industry, the resource fleet is changing. You know, this is a snapshot of, of MISO's actually resource mix. So this snapshot is from 2020, but you can actually see where we plan to go uh, by, by the year 2030. Um, so currently in, in MISO, I, I would say our renewable trend is a bit slower than some of the industry. You know, we currently have 30 gigs of wind, but only three gigs of solar. So the things that, that we're looking at and, and what I'll present later and talking about how we manage these products, you know, we feel that we're just reaching the tipping point um, and learning from the rest of the industry, as Charlie mentioned earlier with the users group, uh, learning a lot of information of what others around the industry are doing and being able to apply that. So with that, you, you can see on, on the chart with the right, you know, we talked yesterday in our users group of how we historically manage the system. You know, I think a common theme there as well was planning for your largest contingency. You know, that's currently what we do today at MISO. Uh, but as you can see, what we've demonstrated with this chart is the actual net ramping needs on the system. And you know, we've already experienced with the mix of resources that we have today, that net ramp reaching over nine gigawatts over the course of an hour. So having the, the right market products, but, but also having the right requirements 
uh, to be able to position your resource fleet to manage those types of events is extremely important. So here, here's an overall look. I'll actually be highlighting our, our short-term reserves and ramp capability product in this presentation. Uh, but I, I did want to highlight the other products in, in MISO's market and the actual uh, commitment and dispatch timeframe uh, that we manage these products uh, through our operational processes. So short-term reserve is a 30 minute to three hour product to manage uncertainty in that timeframe. Our ramp capability product is a 10 minute product to manage uncertainty within 10 to 30 minutes. So we actually have our contingency reserves, so supplemental and spinning reserves uh, to react to those large contingencies uh, to be able to, to bring frequency back in balance on the system. And then obviously regulation you know, is, is actually dispatched at five, five minutes, but it's actually a, a product that manages from four seconds to that five minute time period. And then at MISO, you, you can see our time horizon through our operational processes. So we, we actually execute a, a multi-day forward reliability assessment commitment process every day. Then we actually clear our day ahead market and then execute another real time, what we call our next day forward reliability assessment commitment process uh, to true up our operating plan for the upcoming operating day. And then as we move into the actual real time you know, 24 seven, we are running a intraday reliability assessment commitment process to where we're committing resources to manage the fluctuations on the system in real time. And then we actually, by, by doing that, we use, utilize what we call our look ahead commitment process. So it's looking out our, our default uh, time window is three hours, but we can actually execute cases for, for varying times, you know, upwards of 24 hours so the solution is only as good as the inputs that it has. So obviously, as you get closer and closer, those inputs uh, are a lot more reliable and, and produces uh, more reliable results in that time period. And then obviously our unit dispatch system, five minutes, and then our AGC process. So the first one is our ramp capability product. So again, this is our, our 10 minute product that's utilized to manage the uncertainty within that 10 minute time frame. So we implemented this back in 2016, you know, to manage those increasing net ramp events that we're seeing on the system. You can see from the illustrations, the one on the left is really just the illustration of showing how our, our dispatch system works. So every five minutes, we're approving a case that's actually looking 10 minutes ahead you know, so our unit dispatch system is looking um, on those uncertainties in that time horizon uh, to be able to clear resources and ensure that we have enough ramp capability based on the requirements that we set in our system. So with ramp capability on, on the right, you can see it, it's a co-optimized product. So ramp clears uh, in competition with, with energy, our ancillary products uh, and our short-term reserve products. So you can only clear those products up to your eco max. So it's a, a co-optimized solution uh, based on the, the economics uh, of the market. And then moving on to our, our short-term reserve requirements. Again, this is the product that looks at that 30 minute to three hour time horizon. Uh, this was actually implemented back in December of 2021. You know, one of the things I also wanted to highlight, and, and you can see from the illustration of, of MISO's footprint, uh, one of the, the complexities of our footprint is managing what we call up in the, the upper quadrant is our north central region. And then, you know, most recently, uh, the integration of our south region. Um, so between those two regions, we, we have a regional dispatch transfer that has limited capability of flowing power to manage our footprint. So with that, uh, you have to have the right market products, the right market signals to ensure that you're clearing these reserves in the right regions, in the right zones. So one of the things after implementation that we found that it wasn't 
quite doing that appropriately. So we went back and actually implemented what we called a reserve procurement enhancement, we call that R RPE. So it's essentially defining a constraint uh, for our, our clearing engines, our dispatch system to be able to bind on to ensure that we're clearing these reserves in the right regions. And again, just a couple key features, as I mentioned, the 30 minute to three hour uh, resources must have a 30 minute response time. Um, and, and then STR is cleared actually on both online and offline resources. So we do carry um, those requirements uh, between online and offline resources. And this is just an example of, of highlighting uh, the importance of that, that RPE, that constraint to ensure that we're clearing re these reserves in the right regions. You know, so on a particular operating day, you can see we were actually short on reserve, short on capacity in our south region. You know, the, the illustration on the left is our LMP contour map. So you can see as we went scarce uh, and short on capacity in our south region, we were sending the appropriate market signals uh, so our STR MCPs elevated uh, to reflect those conditions uh, to incite, incentivize uh, resources to be available and provide capacity in that region. So again, as, as I mentioned earlier, it, it's not only important to have the right market products to manage the system, it's important to have the right requirements to deliver the right market outcomes. So that's that's part of the complexity, you know, especially in MISO's market of maintaining reliability in the most efficient manner. So with these, with these products, if you set the requirements too low, you don't send the right market signals. Um, if you set them too high, then you can prematurely send inappropriate market signals when conditions aren't appropriate for those prices to be seen throughout our market. So as our resource fleet is, is transitioning, as we move from how we've historically managed the system, you know, we're moving in a direction of looking at these requirements and looking at the, the uncertainty for upcoming operating days, and then setting these requirements dynamically to be able to manage the actual uncertainty we're expecting for an op upcoming operating day and not based on three, five years of a his historical data and setting these requirements in a static fashion. So one of the things that, that, that we're looking at at MISO, this is a, an illustration. This is actually looking at historical. So the first step in, in doing this is being able to quantify what we consider net uncertainty. So we do have analytics and a model that, that can define and actually provide what level of uncertainty that we have seen historically. You know, the next step in this is then building a model to utilize that information, looking at variables for the upcoming operating day and do that in a predictive fashion. Um, you know, I, I think from the users group, you know, there, there are others that you know, actually have, are more advanced. And, you know, that's why I say I'm, I'm, I'm excited to learn more about that. But, but at MISO, this is currently uh, the path that we're on. Um, you know, I do want to highlight, and I mentioned it yesterday when I showed this, that when you look at this and, you know, to give you a, a, a level of complexity in managing the system when you run this for December 23rd, uh, so Winter Storm Elliott, uh, we actually saw over 20 gigs of net uncertainty. Um, so when you think about that, and, and I joked yesterday of, of going into an operations planning meeting and say, hey, we have to set these requirements to manage 20 gigs of uncertainty, um, you get a lot of wide eyes <laughs> because it's very different. Uh, but that's the direction that, that, that we're definitely moving. Uh, so with that, my last slide is just illustrating the what what we would consider our maturity scale so there's actually looking at you know the the system aspect so our various products what you see highlighted in green is what we're currently focused on is our short-term reserve requirements 
So utilizing that, that predictive model to set those requirements in a more dynamic fashion. And then, you know, as we, we get more renewables, specifically solar, you know, we're expecting which, which others in the industry, you know, again, are farther along at looking at our ramp, ramp requirements, our contingency requirements, and even our regulation requirements to be able to manage those, those high net ramp needs on the system. And then with that, you know, from a technology perspective is actually do, being able to do that more dynamically, even intraday and not just, you know, looking at the, the previous day or the next three days uh, of being able to utilize that model in an intraday fashion. So I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all. Um, hopefully it was insightful of, of the things that we're, we're doing at MISO. Thank you. Right. Um, thank you so much for that great presentation. And um, we're next going to have Ryan King um, speak from ERCOP. Uh, while they set up, um, I, I wanted to say, what, what's the bogey? Sort of why are we here with all these beautiful um, re, um, refined ORDCs or new ancillaries? Um, as I think um, James from Kaiso pointed out in his first so, um, slide, I mean, his first presentation, that operators are going to operate. And if they're going to meet their needs, either with the, with the optimization tools or manually, and um, is our general, I think a general consensus that these products are designed to reduce the need to take these out of market manual operator actions and commit, create products that are both more efficient from an um, engineering and economic standpoint and send signals to market participants, both load and supply resources um, to achieve that. So that's one good thing I think to keep in mind of is that a lot of these ISOs are striving to do the best they can to reduce the need for operators to use heuristics and their own experience, which is certainly excellent to dispatch a system, but in fact, rely on these beautiful optimization tools that are data-driven and just lovely as we'll hear about Today, more on that from Ryan King of ERCOT. He is the manager of market design. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Emma. Well, it's very nice to be able to speak with you all today. This is my uh, second eSIG conference that I've been a uh, participant in. So looking forward to the discussion today. So what I'll be focusing on is really three things. I'll talk a little bit about the role of the ORDC and the value of reserves in particular. I think that's probably the, a key part of this discussion. A little bit about how the ORDC has evolved since, since its inception, as well as a little bit about some future development that we're looking at. So for those who don't know, um, ERCOT does not have real-time co-optimization of energy and ancillary services. So as a result, there is no real dynamic relationship between the real-time energy price and the scarcity of reserves. I'm just gonna use a, a simple example that kind of illustrates this. So this is actually a real life example from, from 2011. What you can see is that um, over the course of this time period, there were system prices that did go to the cap for a number of intervals. However, ERCOT was continuing to shed load up until uh, 1 p.m. on this day. And so the question is, were the prices properly reflecting the value of reserves during these intervals? Now when I speak about the value of reserves, I have to kind of think about what that actually means. So how do you determine the value of reserves? Well, it starts from a few principles. First is that sufficient real-time reserves help avoid load shedding events. Second, there is value in avoiding load shed events. And then the premise here is that the value of real-time reserves equals the value of avoiding load shed. Essentially what an ORDC does best is that it was uh, utilization of the ORDC results in the price of energy reflecting the opportunity cost of reserve scarcity. 
So this slide is really just an illustration of the current iteration of the ORDC. And essentially, uh, as the uh, uh, quantity of reserves starts to diminish, uh, the price of reserves increases to reflect the increased risk, increased risk of loss of load probability. So I think in terms of the context of this discussion, the, the ORDC, in my view, is less concerned with what AS products are needed and more concerned about the value of reserves and in particular, the value of reserves during scarcity. So if nothing else, um, as a, a resource adequacy mechanism, I, I think the ORDC does a very good job of sending the right price signal at the right time. So as with all good market mechanisms, the ORDC has been subject to periodic uh, evolution and adjustment over time. I've highlighted some of the uh, more significant changes. Um, there was a, a change into the uh, inputs for loss of load probability. Uh, this increase caused uh, increased price adders to help address at the time what was concerns around uh, shrinking reserve margins. And probably the more substantial increase that happened on Jan 1, 2022 was an increase in the minimum contingency level. This was increased from 2000 megawatts to 3000 megawatts. Um, so what that change uh, does is it causes prices to rise more quickly along that ORDC curve as reserves fall. So where do we go from here? Well, after uh, some delay, I'm excited to, to say that um, the change to real-time co-optimization is back on the table. Um, this will significantly change um, all uh, many aspects of the market design, just as I was starting to get my head around how things work today. And I did want to talk about what this change will mean, um, because it will have some fairly significant uh, implications for the ORDC. So the biggest change is that instead of using the ORDC, under real-time co-optimization, scarcity pricing and the value of reserves will be set by individual ancillary service demand curves. So this is just kind of an illustration here of what will happen um, if we start to run short of, of, uh, of capacity in one of these scenarios. We'll use this, these AS demand curves to, to set that right shortage price. So how will this be derived? Well, the ASDCs will be based on the shape and pricing outcomes of the current ORDC mechanism. And I'm just kind of illustrating here how that's done, looking at historical prices, and then there'll be individual AS demand curves for the individual ancillary services that are in the ERCOT market. And what this will do is that it will allow um, real-time co-optimization will be able to better distinguish and prioritize between the various ancillary service products. So the prioritization is set by the AS demand curve price. Now in ERCOT's market today, we do do something related to that, but it's far less elegant and um, really needs a sort of out of market, um, uh, well, not, not really out of market, but just manual workarounds to ensure that we're using the right service at the right time. But what this will also allow is that we'll will be able to uh, exhaust the supply of the, the sort of lower quality reserves before we exhaust the supply of our higher quality reserves. Okay, so that's the um, kind of my spin on the ORDC. I think it's more about the value of reserves maybe than the particular products, but uh, happy to take any questions at the end of this discussion. Thank you very much, Ryan. Um, and as you'll notice, there's sort of two general approaches um, to market design evolution to meet changing system needs and high renewable penetration. Um, there's an approach to add new products to meet your, um, your uncertainty in a various, tip, uh, in various time scales, could be a ramp product and a balanced product, a short-term reserve product, or one could buy more of what you're already buying, 10 minute reserves, and that's the approach ERCOT takes. And um, other ISOs also have ORDCs, but 
it's very interesting to see these different evolutions. Um, and our next speaker, um, Keith Parks, who's a senior trading analyst at Excel, is going to talk about something completely different, which is they um, not, not a uh, uh, an ISO with price constraints that are public in LMPs, but needless to say, all um, systems in the in the U.S. Or, and around the globe are dealing with these challenges. So we're going to hear about how um, they're are, uh, managed in vertically integrated market structures. So Keith Parks, the floor is yours. Thank you. I end up talking with my hands a lot. Sorry, put this here. Um, actually, got a promotion. Actually, it wasn't really a promotion. I just got my my title changed. I'm I'm not a I'm not a trading analyst anymore. I'm a senior data scientist. All along, I've been a data scientist, and I didn't know it. But I've been recognized as such, and this is my new title. I think data science is like the the cool new way to be an analyst. And I work with a number of data scientists now and really talented young people are coming into Excel Energy and I'm really excited about it. Um, I'm going to talk about, I, I might not talk about ancillary services all that much. I'm just going to talk about stuff that I think is really interesting. First of all, the Denver Nuggets won the NBA championship last night. That was the ugliest game of the series. But I've been watching the Denver Nuggets ever since Alex English and Kiki Vandaway were playing way back. Um, you have to be here a long time to know those names. Um, but we're gonna mostly focus around, uh, this is Excel Energy Service Territory, which is broken up into three operating companies. And we're gonna really focus on this one in the middle there where we are today, where the star is Denver, Colorado, and that is Excel Energy Colorado, otherwise known as Public Service of Colorado. We are the balancing authority for this region, right? Um, and so um, we are the ones that, through our OAT, um, have various reserve products, Schedule 3, 3A, 5, 6, and 16, this sort of stacking of various reserves to build a balance. Uh, these are transmission services that are offered to the LSEs in the area. Old school, you know, old school, old school um, highly regulated type um, reserve products that, that we provide to everyone within our, our territory. It's changing a little bit. I want to talk a little bit about Excel Energy Colorado, where we are today. And um, I just graphically um, put some things up here. Um, 13, so it's, a, it's about a 7.2 gigawatt peaking system, 13.4 gigawatts of installed capacity. This is the way of the future. You have way more capacity than load, but that capacity isn't always available. Right, because it's dominated by energy limited resources. And actually in 2023, we have transitioned to be a majority energy limited resource system. Look at that. Thermals are now 45% and 55% um, is everything else from wind, solar, DR storage and other. The other is largely run of river hydro, not dispatchable resources, right? Terrifying and exciting at the same time. Um, and then how does that how does that 13.4 gigawatt sort of translate to capacity on a capacity credit basis? Well, I have my stack on the left, and then how those and how that stack sort of you know win, winnows down to the 8.4 megawatts of accredited capacity we have for um, for uh, Excel Energy Colorado. Um, uh, so. In what so what tipped us over in 2023 to be an, a majority energy limited system is a major expansion of solar, 65% increase year over year, an additional 750 megawatts. We've got um, over four gigawatts of wind, over two gigawatts of solar. We're going to have around 650 megawatts of well, let, let's say 1.1 gigawatts of energy storage or energy storage like products. I'm including DR in that because those are four hour products, much like our energy, much like our energy, uh, energy storage. So we're talking seven point, you know, well over half of that, of, of that capacity on an installed basis isn't necessarily available all the time. You know, um, first batteries on the system are on and operating. Thank you. Thank you. Batteries love that. And maybe one of the most exciting things is that we joined a market. Oh my goodness. We joined the SVP Weiss, which is a classic imbalance market 
operating um, in the in the Western Interconnect. So we, we joined that in April of 2023. And so my next slide is going to be talking about successes with a warning. Okay, here, every, this is a complicated graph. Timeline starting from 2021 to end of May. Every dot represents the amount of renewables integrated on the system in that hour. It's on an integrated hourly basis. So on an integrated hourly basis, that's the scatter of dots. And then, and then you have, then it goes down to the bars are months and then years. And so for example, April of 2022, we served almost 60% of our load with renewable energy, wind and solar. Year to date 2023, we are just shy of 44%. We'd be over 44% if we didn't have a terrible January. Boy, January was a terrible month for wind. Everyone's not and people that know. Boy, sucked everywhere. Um, and, and so previously, we were, you know, our hourly integrated max was 91% there in May 1st of 2022, typically happening in the early morning hours when our loads are lowest and our wind was the highest. Well, since the Weiss began in April of one, we hit 113%. How did we do that? Well, we're selling to other neighbors or it's being co-optimized and we're pushing down other thermal generations within the region, not just our own. So do markets help integrate renewables? I would say undoubtedly, yes. So um, from the operations side, we're very excited to have the SPP Weiss. We think it's gonna help us lower costs, increase renewable integration, and overall increase reliability. Though that's the success story is that we've seen this sort of growing um, over my, you know, almost 20 years at Excel, going from almost, you know, 2% renewables now to cresting over 44%, and we're projecting out to be, you know, over 50% by 2025. Um, and that's really been a, a, a coal dominated system and being able to sort of, to be able to, you know, roll those off in a, in, in, in a fair and equitable manner for the communities that are being served there. Um, and, and being able to bring on these new resources. Um, the warning is on the bottom right. There's two events there. Neither of those events are Elliot. Everyone talks about Elliot. Here are two events, not Elliot. End of January, end of February. A cold multi-day low RE event. That's the first arrow. The second one, a month later, a cold icing, we had no wind. Wind was negative on the system. There was zero wind in the state of Colorado. It was actually drawing low R event, right? So um, while, while it is exciting to see 113% being integrated, at least from a company basis, you know, um, and, and seeing percentages in hitting 44 and, and looking to get over 50%, um, there are still those events. And this is, um, this is the future for the Colorado system is winter and that we will become a winter RA, winter reliability critical system. And we'll do that sooner than anyone expects. Now let's talk about reserves. Okay. Um, Today we have two dominant. We have we have we have the classic contingency reserves, which we are participate in the Northwest Power Pool to receive. Totally classic. What's the what's the largest contingency? And, and let's share in in covering that largest contingency. And that largest contingency is is a thermal unit, is a thermal plant. It doesn't allow us the the Northwest Power Pool does not allow us to qualify a radial transmission line feeding 1400 megawatts of wind as that we have to cover that right so for, th th for so this is a thermal only so we we hold that contingency reserves as part of that pool right and that's not going away on top of that we hold this thing called flex reserves and it's to deal with extreme wind uncertainty sort of large down ramps and that's in real time 
So we're dealing with that in real time. And so we've done this since, I think we started doing this in like 2014, when we started seeing one of the largest risks on the system was actually a, a lot of wind and then all that wind going away over the course of tens of minutes, not five minutes or, you know, not short term, but maybe over 30 minutes. And that's a 30 minute product that we've been holding. And it is dynamic, meaning that it is a function of the amount of wind that we see in the BA at that time. No wind, no reserve. Lots of wind, a lot of reserve, right? And then on top of that, we've had, and, and, and that's schedule 16, right? And on top of that, we have our regulating reserves, which is like schedule three and three A. And, and, and we, we went and said, hey, look, you know, this is sort of like normal uncertainty. It's sort of uncertainty. It tends to, it, it tends to follow the hours of the day. You have more uncertainty um, in the morning ramp, in the evening peak, then you do the other times. And so we had this, you know, we, we, we had the schedule that, hey, if you're, if you're bringing different types of resources, you know, we, you know, that burdens the system with different regulating reserve needs, right? And that was, that was to cover sort of solar load and normal wind uncertainty, and then we had the extreme stuff. Well, remember I talked about that increase in solar, right? Well, our tendency would be like, oh, now we got to have a ramping product that deals with, with solar. And we got to have something specific for solar, solar uncertainty. And instead of doing that, and much like my other colleagues here, is in, because that would be sort of like taking contingency reserves and then stacking some wind uncertainty and then stacking some solar uncertainty on top of that. And then and holding this bevy of, of products all on top of one another, when actually they all sort of like cancel one another out and are related, right? To a certain extent, some, there are some differences. So instead of us, our, our gut reaction is like, well, we just need another reserve product, right? We're gonna move towards a dynamic reserve where solar load and wind uncertainty are considered holistically, looking at different forecast horizons, uh, starting with day ahead and, and producing a product much like Cal ISO is doing for their imbalance market, looking at the differences in, in, in how forecasts realize and what that uncertainty looks like. Um, and then, and then having that move, move to a, a real-time product as well so that that dynamic reserve is considering solar load and wind at the time of the system, you know, what that is at that time, right? We had hoped to put this out to bid and get some consultants to help us with it, but we don't have any money. So um, we are going to use um, Dynador, which is an EPRI product, uh, Eric Ela and Miguel um, I'm going to blow, I'm going to, I'm going to mess his name up, a name that's complicated to my ears and so my memory, um, but they are going to um, help us uh, develop this um, dynamic reserve product using the Dynador product that, that um, EPRI has produced. Um, and so that we hope is going to ultimately reserve reduce the amount of reserves we'll be holding at any one time, increase the operational reliability, and we hope provide greater operational transparency overall, um, which I think is just good for everyone. And that's my talk. Thanks everyone. Um, thank you very much, Keith. Um, we have come to our final presenter, Ryan Shapi of EPRI. And, and remember how earlier we, I discussed the various approaches that um, IS system operators inside and outside RTO markets use to meet their system needs, principally variable, net variable and uncertain net loads. Um, Ryan is going to be talking about flexibility products and ORDCs and asking, are they different? And he's gonna compare and contrast them. So thank you very much, Ryan. I can follow on that very exciting presentation. All right, so we're gonna talk about basically building a new dedicated market product um, and compare that with uh, ORDC. All right. So a little bit of history lesson, you know, power systems need not just capacity, but that didn't get.
Is that better? Yeah. Thank you, sir. My apologies. Um, so power systems need, need not just capacity, but it's gotta be rampable. So it's gotta be something you can get within a certain time period. Um, so that's very important. Um, we usually refer to this rampable capacity as flexibility. All right. So this used to be something that was more or less ubiquitous. So um, historically in the past, let's say 20 something years ago, you had your base load resources. So coal, you know, nuclear, hydro, um, and they were more or less kind of status quo. And then as you got into your peak period, if you found out that you missed your load forecast and you, didn't, you needed some additional capacity, you would get one of your natural gas peakers online. So that's my understanding. I was not an engineer at the time, but this was more or less the um, kind of the extent of the type of uncertainty they dealt with, a bit more deterministic than what we're dealing with today. Um, so now we need to manage this um, far more explicitly and just procuring the usual traditional amounts of regulation and contingency reserves um, is no longer enough to satisfy the type of ramp needs that we have on the system. All right, so the system operator, it's really their job um, to make sure there is enough flexibility, that and the market, of course, um, on various time horizons. So in the short term, 10 minutes, 30 minutes, um, one hour, multiple hours, multiple days, this is their job um, in order you know, to maintain reliability. Um, so an example might be of something you'd have to deal with is, let's say the unforecasted loss of you know, multiple gigawatts um, of you know, your renewables, so your wind and solar with you know, fairly short no notice. Um, so this is not super common, um, but, you know, you have certain pressure systems, you know, the changes in the weather where this can actually happen to where your, your day ahead and your, um, your rut process and so on. Um, the, the forecasting that occurs at those time periods doesn't um, show what you need to have happen. So you have to be prepared for that. Um, another example might be, this is something um, when I was working with the ISO back in 2018, uh, natural gas prices were very low. Um, so it was kind of an somewhat unusual situation where a lot of the really um, quick moving natural gas units, um, the fast starts were actually highly economical. So they were committed in a day ahead and running at their max. Um, so, which is, you know, that's how the economics showed it. Um, but you run into an issue where all of a sudden certain things happen, you need more uh, capacity to bring it online and quickly. And you realize that the only thing you have offline to bring online are plants that take maybe half a day or multiple days to start up. So you have to really start thinking about how can I change the market um, or change our operational processes to where um, to make this not so much of an issue. Um, another example might be a, you know, instead of unforecasted, having a forecasted change, but it's still very large um, and occurring over a relatively short period of time. So if you look at, you know, for example, uh, Kaiso's duck curve um, in, you know, 2018 compared to what we have today, that the back of the duck has been, you know, put poor duck, it's been pushed down and down and down. And now the uh, amount of ramp that you need is um, pretty significant over a fairly short period of time. So even if you know about that issue, you still have to move your um, replacement generation, your backups to, uh, you know, to deal with that in a relatively short amount of time. So there are two main market methods uh, to handle these types of problems that we're gonna talk about today. The first is a building a dedicated market product. And we'll talk about, you know, several of the ISOs have done this. Another option is to what we call upgrade or enhance or adjust an existing product. And this is what ORDC does. Um, and we also, in the, in the appendix later, we'll show a lot of other methods you can do for dealing with flexibility issues. So the first one, um, you know, creating a dedicated product of some kind. These are often, the, the, nom the naming of this can get a little confusing, but these are often referred to as ramp products or uncertainty products or flexibility products. Um, so with this method, you know, you create a new product that ensures you have enough rampable capacity um, for the chosen time horizon. Um, and if you don't, well, then shortage pricing occurs. So here we have the, the common graph that's used. Um, this came out of uh, Navid and Rosenwald study when they were doing this for MISO, I believe. Um, so each time period at time T0, time T1, time T2, you're looking ahead to the future and making sure you can actually reach that value. But also you recognize that there's uncertainty in both the upward and the downward direction. So that future demand point of net demand, it, it's not certain. 
So you kind of get the baby shark uh, moving forward in time, um, so to speak. And um, you know, with the variability and the uncertainty together, that forms the requirement for this type of product. Um, it depends on how you design it, but you know, both online resources or offline as well could be used. Uh, typically, we've seen at least the in the very short term, if it's a very short term product, usually um, it might be online only because there's not maybe a huge amount of offline resources that could respond. Um, that's probably changing though. Um, if it's a much longer term product, well, you've got to allow offline resources to participate that could become, um, what do you call it, be committed and come online within that time range. Um, there's different ways you can do uh, lost opportunity costs is pretty common, or you can have dedicated offers for these products. A lot of different ideas on the best way to do that. Um, and essentially, you, you know, procure the capacity or the rampable capacity of the flexibility. Um, and then the reserves are automatically deployed by SCED uh, when needed. So these, this type of product exists today in, all, you know, in at least three ISOs that I'm aware of. Uh, Kaiso has their flexible ramping product and they have their proposed and balanced reserve, which is kind of not exactly like the uh, graph we have shown here, but you know, it shares a bit in common with that. MISO has their ramp product in their uh, short-term reserve, STR. Uh, SPP has a, a ramp product as well, and they have an upcoming uncertainty reserve that I believe is going live next month, I think. July? Okay, thank you, Brooke. Uh, another option would be to, you know, adjust, upgrade, however you want to say it, an existing market product. So instead of going through the big effort of going from scratch to a brand new product, well, let's make some adjustments and see if we can get the same type of value without as much effort, um, so to speak. Um, let's see. So a good example of this might be, you know, you decide you need something to deal with uh, primary frequency response. So you could build a complicated new product to do that, or you could simply say, okay, we're going to require that all the contingency reserves be frequency responsive. Um, so they can actually, and you do some analysis and you say, this will pretty much cover the need that you would um, satisfy with the frequency response product. So it's kind of um, a way to get what you need with a lot less effort. Another option like we just talked about might be to um, need some rampable capacity. Um, you can just modify the existing contingency reserve demand curve. And we'll cover that in detail on the next slide. Um, so we don't really need to read into this a whole lot, but SVP has a, in their uncertainty product white paper, they kind of showed a high level way of looking at, you know, at the very bottom here, for their uncertainty product, they have these three red circles that are filled in to show that it, it meets a lot of their type of uh, needs, such as ramp and time and the impact on the commitment, the market transparency with the price signals. And they looked at other options as well, such as well, instead of having a product um, that's transparent, has offers, well, let's just have a constraint in the day ahead. You know, how will that work? You know, and that will probably help a little bit, but there's certain you know, downsides to that. They looked at it all the way to how about we just clear a, you know, a bunch more regulation. Um, and you know, that could certainly solve the problem, but that might also be very expensive um, if you don't need to have um, five minute response for an hour product. Um, so moving along to ORDC as an example of you know, upgrading an existing product. Um, so the over, you know, I know we've already had ORDC, so I'll try to go fast through this, but the concept is that we're good on time? Okay. Uh, the concept is basically that there's always value to having more reserves uh, on the system than what you need well, up to a certain point um, because we all know about diminishing returns. So over here in this first red box, we can see the, you know, the flat line at $5,000 that's occurring at you know, the 3,000 megawatt requirement. So basically meaning that you know, having at least you know, 3,000 megawatts is absolutely essential and they're gonna value that at the value of loss load um, value of $5,000 per megawatt hour. Now, moving forward, they know that beyond 3,000 megawatts, there's still value in getting more. So getting, going from 3,000 to 4,000, 5,000, even 6,000 megawatts, there's still value in all that. Um, but it, as they get more and more reserves on the system this way, um, the value declines um, to the system because there's a lower probability of actually needing that. You know, they're very confident in needing 3000 megawatts, but 4000, okay, we'll, we'll still pay some for that. We'll still pay some for 5000, but each period it's, it's less and less. 
until finally you get to this kind of last section here where it's approaching zero um, because it's your, your the added reliability, um, I guess benefit you get is, is becomes negligible at that point. All right, so this, this sloped curve here, um, this allows for uh, the commitment and procurement of additional flexibility past the actual need, which is very similar to a dedicated market product. So um, I just wanted to add here, this is not just a ERCOT thing, you know, PJM, I don't know what their current status is, but they considered for a long time moving in this direction. So multiple other organizations have considered it. Um, real quick, I'm not gonna read over the entire table, I don't think, but you know, if we just compare you know, Flex and ORDC, there's a lot of ways to do this, but um, the requirement setting might be a little bit different. Remember with the dedicated product, you're using maybe something like the, the baby shark with the variability and uncertainty or you're looking at um, like the imbalance reserve of the kind of the delta between the day ahead and the real time, the uncertainty there. Um, ORDC, I believe is looking at the kind of the difference between the, the, the hour look ahead and the real time. Um, so there's slight differences there. Um, with scarcity pricing, ORDC is using that value of lost load as kind of the main metric, um, you know, multiplied by the loss of load probability. Um, the, for the dedicated market product, there's, there's many different ways they can do this. They can also do it essentially in a very similar manner. Usually they um, do it as the next, the value of the next operator action. So if they know that the operator, when they need some additional megawatts, they're gonna have to commit an offline quick start unit or fast start, um, then they can kind of average that together and look and say for the last month, this is the cost of doing that sort of operation. So we can build a point on the curve based on that. And they go, okay, well, what happens after that? Do we have to get you know, cut some sort of tags or do we have to get emergency power purchases? They, they, go, they go through all the different metrics until they get to the value of lost load. So that's, that's another method to do it. Um, so there's, and there, and there are quite a few ways to come up with the different curves on the demand curve. Um, as far as the, the number of steps, um, you know, the, we see that, you know, they, um, it, it varies. They might have five, six, uh, less uh, steps with a traditional market product. With ORDC, they have that $5,000 um, dollars per megawatt hour uh, value of lost load, and then it slopes downward. So that's a difference there. Um, pricing can be done a little bit differently. Um, the, with these new flexibility products, most of the ISOs, I believe all of them have not cascaded it, meaning that when they go short on that, price there doesn't feed into the other market products. Um, ORDC, of course, is just, it's the existing contingency reserve demand curve. So it will be part of price cascading. Um, as far as market processes, the RDC is within the day, I believe is that's in day ahead and real time or can be. Um, while the mar these other market products that you could choose to implement as a day ahead only or real time only or within both. Uh, really just depends on the ISO and what they're trying to do. Um, so moving forward, uh, in conclusion, I just want to say, you know, flexibility is it's absolutely vital already to many of the ISOs. Um, if you have large amounts of renewables, um, your chances are flexibility is a huge topic to your ISO, and it will continue to grow in importance um, over time as the energy transition uh, moves forward. Um, there's multiple methods for procuring additional flexibility. Let's move forward to the appendix real quick to look at this. Um, so here's a pretty cool chart that shows um, that, you know, every put together one of their deliverables. Um, so in the top left-hand corner, we have, you know, flexibility products like, you know, the ramp product. Um, one, move one over to the right, and you've got ORDC. So these are the two ones we've talked about predominantly. Uh, move one over, and you've got um, multi-interval pricing to where I just, you know, even in, for each five-minute period, I'm still looking at decisions that are occurring maybe an hour or more into the future, um, and I'm reflecting that into the current price. This is a, that's another way to do it, um, to reflect, you know, to try to get the ramp you need. Um, you can build stochastic models. There's a lot of different ways to do that. Um, one of the ways I've seen is lots and lots, instead of having the explicit reserve requirements, you have lots of scenarios that represent certain events, such as the loss of, you know, large portion of your wind, loss of a single, you know, your most single severe, you know, your largest unit. Um, lots of different scenarios can actually get to get you the flexibility you need without having to explicitly say how much, you know, regulation you need. Um, moving to that second row, um, there's, you know, ways to, okay, if we don't have enough flexibility, well, let's have various auction mechanisms or maybe outside the market or in the capacity market and so on um, to, you know, get that generation that's needed. Um, then there's looking at the other side, you have supply and demand, 
Um, and if demand is more responsive to price, well, then that solves your issue there. Um, also with energy storage, um, if you imagine that kind of duck curve scenario, um, you know, if you want to make that curve less of a problem, you know, if you have enough storage, you can, you know, of course, start charging whenever the prices are really low, which is going to keep it from getting so far down. And you can, um, you know, let that energy out, um, use it as supply on the flip side of it. So you can kind of push that curve down and flatten it a bit. Uh, and of course, you know, the last one of, you know, reduce the uncertainty by getting better at forecasting. And that one's a little, a little harder, I think. The, um, the ISOs already have very good um, forecasts between, you know, a day out, you know, for wind and I believe solar. So I'm sure there's always different ways to improve there. But um, at this point, they're probably making kind of smaller improvements than, you know, five years ago, um, where most of the low hanging fruit has been picked. So out of all this, the, the two ones in the top left corner are the ones that are mostly being discussed right now, because some of these are kind of hard to do. Um, like energy storage, you need to get a lot of storage before that really comes into account there. So moving back a little bit, um, so multiple methods, but you know, building a dedicated market product or going the ORDC route seems to be the most common right now that's being discussed. Um, we'll see, I think, more of the other ones as time, move, time moves forward. Um, the, so my colleagues, uh, Eric Gila and uh, Philip Mello did some research on you know, using an ERCOT-like system um, that shows that both of these methods, um, the dedicated product and the RDC, um, can procure the flexibility needed for a reliable system to reduce shortages. They also showed that you know, even buying the additional, um, having to you know, procure the additional um, flexibility costs money, but it could actually save dollars overall if you're you know, preventing all sorts of shortage conditions. Um, you know, they, both these methods share, you know, quite a lot in common. Um, and this is kind of interesting, but, you know, the regions that have a dedicated, you know, flexibility product, they have something that um, in this paper here, they call the composite curve. So if we can look at that real quick. So at the top here in the dark blue line, you have ERCOT's ORDC um, with the, you know, the $5,000 and then the sloping curve here. If you look at the other ISOs as well that, you know, don't have the ORDC, but have multiple products, um, if you take the, all those demand curves together and normalize them, it's pretty similar to an ORDC. Um, so they're kind of both, all these things are kind of essentially doing this, um, accomplishing some of the same goals. Um, so I thought that was, you know, very neat uh, seeing that chart there. <laughs> so uh, despite all the similarities though, there are certainly differences. Um, if we go back um, to, you know, why these uh, techniques were made to begin with, um, the flexibility products, at least they started with having issues with the um, transient price spikes. So they had certain types of price spikes that weren't because there was any true shortage, but because they were only looking at a very narrow time window. So they found out that by looking a little further into the future and optimizing that way, they could prevent a lot of those um, price spikes that didn't make a whole lot of sense. ORDC, on the other hand, is really trying to make sure that you know, they, it's a, it's kind of Texas, at least at the time, I believe it's their resource adequacy mechanism to make, to incentivize resources to show up when times are dire. Um, so if there's a $5,000 price, you're not going to want to miss out on that. Um, so there's that, and it helps also with the kind of the missing money problem. So the, those two products have, or those two methods have very different um, methods to why they were built. But I think the, the research that Eric and Philip did really showed that, you know, they're, they're essentially the same in a lot of ways. And they could be made um, if you start with the same system and choose the same time horizon and so on, you can really get the exact same type of um, impact from them outside of some of the pricing. Um, so I think, you know, ISOs will want to evaluate, you know, moving forward, the ones that already aren't, you know, doing this, um, aren't, you know, building a product, will probably want to evaluate both options potentially um, and see which one makes the most sense for their system. It, it does cost a lot of time and stakeholder effort to go through the getting creating a new market product there's a lot of effort involved there's the the market software itself um, educating your participants and so on so that's one of the advantages i think to the ordc method there thank you oh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> emma then has to take a look at it and <laughs> so just different ways of doing the same thing thank you all